My name is Scott Kellner. I am the editor and translator of the Cambridge University Press edition of My Opposition, The Diary of Friedrich Kellner, A German Against the Third Reich. And I am the grandson of Friedrich and Pauline Kellner. This is a story about just one evening in the Third Reich that makes us wonder if we would have acted the same way had we been there. Ordinarily, I would say we can be thankful we are not placed in such a situation. But the way things have been going lately, who knows? In any case, here's what happened with my grandmother, Pauline. She hated Adolf Hitler's posturing and his vulgar tirades against perceived enemies. And she also hated that his name was ever on the adoring lips of her fellow citizens all around her. Heil Hitler, Führer, you command, will follow. But the wife of Justice Inspector Friedrich Kellner refused to hail the Führer, and her attitude was noted by the authorities. They lived in the small town of Laubach, but were originally from Mainz where they had been active in the Social Democratic Party during the short time of the Weimar Republic. They had organized rallies and campaigned against Hitler and his violent National Socialists. But when Hitler came to power in 1933, the Kellners moved from the city to Laubach, where they weren't known for their political activities. Friedrich's new position there as the administration manager of the courthouse included an apartment for them on the ground floor. A second apartment in the building was for the judge and his family. Hitler very swiftly ended democratic rule, and the people accepted that because he promised to restore Germany to its former glory, which was lost when Germany was defeated in World War I, a war they started. They even accepted the Nazi government's cruel treatments of their own people, euthanizing German mental patients, or as Friedrich Kellner would later describe it in his diary, turning the psychiatric hospitals into murder centers. And they imposed severe punishments, including death sentences on any German who would not conform. Also alarming was the materialization on Germany's streets of the dark rantings in Hitler's book, Mein Kampf. Jews were labeled subhumans and publicly subjected to humiliations and physical beatings. They were stripped of their German citizenship and made stateless. Polish Jews were forced back to Poland. And when that happened, a 17-year-old Jewish boy living in Paris who learned that his parents had been deported went to the German embassy and crying out that he was avenging persecuted Jews, he shot one of the German diplomats. Nothing could have been better for Hitler, who immediately used the murder of a German official by a Jew to carry out a massive terror campaign against the remaining Jews in Germany, a pogrom to take place in every city, town, and village led by the local units of stormtroopers and the older boys and the Hitler Youth, and as many townsfolk who wanted to join in. Late in the evening of November 9th, 1938, a Wednesday, in the middle of the week, Laubach stormtroopers showed up on the courthouse street, trailed by a noisy mob. Beyond the courthouse, at the end of the street, lived the Jewish merchant, Sally Heinemann, and his wife, Hulda. Three years earlier, Hulda Heinemann had carefully approached Pauline to ask if Friedrich could keep her son-in-law from being arrested. Laubach's mayor, Burgermeister Herdy, had made up false charges against her son-in-law, Julius Apt, in order to confiscate his property. Friedrich didn't have the authority to stop the confiscation, but he and Pauline helped Julius get to Hamburg so he could leave for America. Julius's wife, Lucy, the Heinemann's daughter, stayed behind because she was pregnant, but when her son was born, the Kellners helped them leave Laubach. 
Pauline and Friedrich tried to convince the elder Heinemanns to leave Laubach too, but Hulda and Sally felt certain their neighbors would do them no harm. On November 9th, 1938, Pauline looked out her apartment window at the clamoring mob with dismay, though not with surprise. Joseph Goebbels had launched two days of incendiary radio broadcasts and newspaper headlines claiming that world Jewry had declared war on every German. The many flashlights waving about in the cold air weren't necessary with such a large moon outside, and Pauline easily made out Albert Haas in the front. Arrogance personified was Friedrich's term for the leader of Laubach's stormtroopers. It was especially galling for Pauline that Haas was also the high school teacher. Boys of the Hitler Youth kept up with the men, and many were Haas's students. In such a small town, it was easy for Pauline to identify almost everyone, especially the town bully, Billy Rule, who was shouting the loudest. She could never fully explain to me what came over her at such a sight, a mix of anger, disgust, the wish to disbelieve her eyes, and dread as though standing in front of an oncoming train. And she had this sense of loss, a depressing sense of mourning for her country, which had fallen back from a golden era when Germany was a leading nation in the sciences and in the arts and music, falling back into a dark cavern of Neanderthal hatreds. All she distinctly remembered thinking was, this is so wrong, so wrong, which is what she said to Friedrich as she ran outside. He quickly followed with her winter coat, and he saw Pauline shake her open hand scornfully at Haas, and then grab at the young boys, many taller than she was, yanking sharply on their jackets as they tried to dodge her. My grandfather described how he draped the coat around her shoulders and tried to get her to come away. The sight of the imposing justice inspector at the side of the furious lady gave pause to some of the boys. But before they could turn back home, Albert Haas and Billy Rule were confronting the Kellners. This isn't your business, said Haas sharply, to which Friedrich replied, you have no lawful order to be here. I told you, repeated Haas, it's none of your business. Try to stop us and you'll be sorry. Hearing that, an indignant Pauline stretched her five-foot frame before the six-foot Nazi. You, a teacher, in front of your students, threatening the court administrator, leading your pupils into criminal acts? Haas stepped toward her, but she wouldn't budge, and Friedrich, who had served as an infantry sergeant in the Great War, put his arm out to keep Haas from moving closer. Billy Rule and a number of other stormtroopers join Haas in forming a circle, blocking the Kellner's passage and slowly forcing them back to the courthouse gate. You're all madmen, said Pauline, unable to break through. Friedrich went to the upstairs apartment in the courthouse to speak to the judge. Pauline went to see Frau Desch, leader of the Nazi Women's League. Judge Schmidt refused to have the police intervene, and Pauline, who more than once had turned down membership in the Women's League, had no better luck with Frau Desch. Sally and Hulda Heinemann, and the Strauss family members in Laubach, and the Jews in the surrounding villages were cruelly beaten, the homes were damaged, and the contents of those homes, furniture, clothing, documents, keepsakes, were tossed through the windows and the mob of the master race snatched up anything they wanted and took it home. Thieves and looters. Jewish cemeteries that night and synagogues were desecrated and the Torah scrolls and books from the Laubach synagogue were fuel for a bonfire. The next day Friedrich tried to press charges against Albert Haas and Billy Rule, but Judge Schmidt wouldn't hear of it. 
and instead he told Friedrich, It is Frau Kellner and you who are being investigated, not our honored high school teacher. Their ancestry was going to be searched to see how it might explain their concern for Jews. Fortunately, Friedrich had family records dating back hundreds of years, including all the Lutheran baptism documents, and the case was quickly dropped. However, the Kellners were written up as bad influences on the people and placed under surveillance by the Gestapo. From then until the end of the war, Friedrich chronicled in his diary Nazi crimes and the people's willing support of the merciless agenda. There was, toward the end, to be some degree of justice. Burgermeister Herge was sent to Poland to oversee one of the occupied cities, and he was killed there. The school teacher, Albert Haas, and the bully, Willy Ruhl, were killed by Russian troops on the Eastern Front, and Judge Schmidt, who was sent to fight in Russia in the final months of war, he wound up spending the last six years of his life at hard labor in a Russian prison camp. It may very well be what Friedrich proclaimed in his diary upon learning of Albert Haas's death, that all guilt is avenged on earth. After the war, the German government recompensed the Heinemann's daughter Lucy and her husband Julius for the properties that had been stolen from them. A bitter compensation, to be sure. Their son, John Peter Apt, would never know his murdered grandparents. However, the Apps did thrive in America, and after receiving his Ph.D., the grandson of Sally and Hulda Heinemann devoted his life to improving agriculture in arid countries to help feed the world. Yet another reminder to all of us of what was lost to civilization when six million other Jewish minds and hearts were destroyed by totally irrational prejudices that came from, as Pauline called them, madmen. As for Friedrich Kellner's petite wife and her attempt to stem the tide of senseless hatred, the court administrator wrote this. In all of Germany, there are to be found few wives of officials who showed the same courage. Yes, she is most definitely courageous. And the reader of my notes will understand when I propose here that a monument should be erected to my brave Pauline. My grandfather's diary is itself a monument for my grandmother. Pauline Kellner shared his every risk as he chronicled that period of horror so that future generations could use his diary as a weapon of truth to combat their own Nazis. We call them neo-Nazis, more madmen. I have a video on YouTube about that. I hope you have a chance to watch it. In any case, I thank you for watching this one.